Welcome, everyone. This is an episode in our series entitled Paul's Contradictions of Jesus. You can jump in anywhere. We've actually done 18 contradictions of uh, Jesus by Paul previous to this. And uh, the last episode, though, we did a total of 15. uh, And that was all the salvation statements of Jesus. He had a varied uh, amount of uh, statements. Here we're going to look, we're going back to our method of really just looking at one particular passage at a time. This is verse uh, number 19, contradiction number 19. Jesus tells the apostles to teach his commands given prior to his ascension while in the flesh. That's in Matthew 28, verse 20, but Paul says not to do so. You'll see why. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. Okay. Now, every episode uh, of the series will begin with this uh, segment here, and if you have already heard this segment, you're going to be able to skip it if you want. Uh, And the introduction here is to establish the ground upon which a contradiction of by Paul of Jesus is material, even in Paul's own admission. So um, let's begin. And we'll see here in the title of this intro is Paul supports the test of Jesus' words against his, Paul's own words, to validate or invalidate himself. So Paul admits that Paul Jesus' words are contradictory to what he says are contradictory. He is invalidated as a man of pride. So let's continue. Let's begin the uh, the uh, article here. Paul says, anyone whose words contradict those of Jesus in his teaching is to be rejected as a man of pride. Paul thus endorses Jesus' words only as a test of orthodoxy. Paul says, if any man, which obviously includes Paul, gives different teaching not in agreement with the true words of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching which is in agreement with true religion, he has an high and high... <laughs> He has an over high opinion of himself, being without knowledge, having only an unhealthy love of questioning and war of words from which come envy, fighting, cruel words, evil thoughts. First Timothy 6 verses 3 to 4, basic Bible in English. And um, that is one of the better translations. But I want you to see the literal, the interlinear of from Mouncey. Let's read it here. If someone teaches a different doctrine and does not adhere or agree to the healthy or sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm just adding there's a couple of things that other people, uh, the NIV, for example, say sound and so on, or agree. So I'm just showing there's a, there is a range of meaning there too. So who do not agree or adhere to the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the teaching that is according to godliness and, and most other texts would say, uh, and don't, and, and don't, agree to the godly teaching or agree to godly teaching he that person who contradicts jesus and doesn't have godly teaching either one (laughs) he is puffed up with conceit understanding nothing but as a sickly craving for speculations the craving there is nosio for speculations and fights about words out of which come envy strife slanders evil suspicions so if paul actually violates his own statements here you can conclude he's a man puffed up with conceit understanding nothing but has a sickly craving speculation fights about words now let's consult a little bit of commentary on that passage just so we're reading it correctly the verse begins by saying if anyone preaches differently the greek is heterodidaskale heterodidaskale and does not assent or agree poserkate to the sound teachings of the master messiah jesus then such a person has pride and understanding nothing greek the phrase and to godly teaching is not distinct from jesus teachings previously mentioned but is a more a special explanation of the preceding reference to jesus teachings that's in herman's herman allshausen's biblical commentary sheldon 1866 volume 6 at 150. gary smalley properly translates as paul saying that if anyone quote advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words those of our lord jesus christ then they are guilty of pride Smallly bound by honor, year 2000 at 156. Hence, Paul makes Jesus' words the highest authority in the church, and hence the test of anyone's doctrine, including his own. As McQuilkin comments in this passage, Paul appealed to the, quote, teaching of Jesus as having the highest authority, end of quote, in obedience to Jesus' final commission, which was for the apostles to teach, quote, quote, the nations, the Gentiles, everything I have commanded you, and he cited Matthew 28, verse 20, this is in J. J. Robertson McKilkin's book, An Introduction to Biblical Ethics, 1995 to 49. I mean, this verse is very straightforward, right? You can't get around it. And, and even if you don't like saying that Paul can be subject to the words of Jesus, he said so. So, you know, if you believe in Paul and you believe in inspired, then you must submit to this criteria that he could be invalidated if he contradicts the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's very comport with the elevated importance that Jesus put on his own words, 
Our Lord said, quote, there is a judge for the one who does not accept my words, that very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day, John 12, verse 48. So Paul is not exempt from that requirement that he can't contradict Jesus. And if he does, Jesus is going to have him subject to condemnation on the last day. Paul is in, also in accord with Jeremiah's criticism about interloping prophets who steal the Lord's words from listeners by making rival claims to authority. And this is what Jeremiah says in 23, verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord Yahweh, that steal my words, everyone, from his neighbor. So if somebody contradicts Jesus, what are they doing? They're stealing the words of Yahweh that were given to Jesus by that interloper contradicting Jesus. All right, so now we're going to look at uh, contradiction number 19 by Paul of Jesus. And uh, it's entitled, Jesus tells the apostles to teach his commands given prior to his ascension while in the flesh, Matthew 28, verse 20. But Paul says not to do so, and that's in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, as we shall see. And let's read here. After the risen Lord proved he had the same nail holes as he had on the cross, Jesus' final words just before he ascended into heaven were that the apostles should teach, quote, everything that I commanded you, Matthew 28, 20. Jesus, and it's called the Great Commission. Jesus must have meant to teach all his commands prior to the cross and not simply any given after he rose from the dead and prior to ascension. How do we know that? The reason we know this is true is because none of the four Gospels contain any post-cross commands, except this one, to give the commands that he'd previously given. If Jesus meant by his command to teach the world, quote, all that I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 20, to teach only his commands post-resurrection, the four Gospels would have contained such commands, obviously, right? Because we're now post-resurrection. However, there are none quoted except the command in Matthew 28, 20 to teach Jesus' commands previously given. Hence, Jesus clearly meant by, quote, everything I commanded you to be his words in his er earthly ministry before his resurrection. Hence, Jesus could only have meant that post-ascension, the apostles were to teach the pre-cross teachings of Jesus while he was clearly, quote, in the flesh. However, Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, is interpreted to justify rejecting this. Quote, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, from this time forward, know we him no more. In the way he was in the flesh is the implication. The famous influential evangelical theologian Rudolf Bultmann said 2 Corinthians 5.16 means we no longer know Christ in the flesh, i.e. we supposedly can dispense with Jesus' teachings when he was in the flesh. Paul tells us that the only message Paul received from the resurrected Christ, who supposedly no longer had flesh, which is a whole other problem, is the means to know Christ any longer. Read this way by Boltman, Paul tells us to, we no longer know or need to know Jesus' message delivered pre-resurrection when he was in the flesh. This is also how Christian theologian and physician Albert Schweitzer, who lived from 1875 to 1965, viewed 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 in his 1911 book. I'm not good at German, but I'll try it. Geschichte der Polanischen Forschung, J.C.B. Moore, and that's at archive.org at page 191. And that link will bring you there if you want to read it. In uh, read it if you want to read it in English. The next site is the translation is called Paul and His Interpreters: The Conception of Authority in the Pauline Writings, 1918 to 336. If you click it, you will be taken to that full book in English, and you can read the quote. Schweitzer <laughs> explained: Since the death and resurrection of the Lord, Paul believed conditions were present that were wholly new, that they made his Jesus's teaching inapplicable. Okay, and, and they're basing that on the fact that Paul never quotes Jesus except the communion. Okay, and here's part of what uh, Albert Schweitzer uses as proof. Thus, Albert Schweitzer says this is what explains Paul's failure to mention any significant teachings of Jesus. So he's saying this as a, a, a proof why we can ignore Jesus, because Paul ignores Jesus. That's how we, we can use Paul as our role model, in other words. We can ignore Jesus just as much Paul as does does. So... Don't take this as a critique of Paul. This is an exhortation to us to obey Paul's example. Okay, so you have to know these, these German theologians in Germany, pre-Nazi, they were setting the, the German people up for a big fall by teaching them to just totally disregard Jesus because Paul discarded him. So this is his proof at the same page at that same article I gave you a link to. If we had only St. Paul to guide us, we should not know that Jesus spoke in parables, that he spoke the Sermon on the Mount and taught his people the Lord's Prayer. 
I remember when I first read that, I thought this has got to be somebody who's anti-Paul <laughs> until I read it. And I go, my gosh, he's actually telling us this is a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, anyway, indeed, with the sole exception of the communion formula at 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 25, Paul does not quote any sayings of the historical Jesus as found in the written Gospels. Or he doesn't even quote him directly talking to him, with the one exception is when he prays three times to his Jesus and his Jesus uh, to, to release him from an angelos satanas, an angel of Satan, who he says is tormenting him. That's the word he uses in Greek tormenting him and jesus uh, uh, responds to paul's three pleas please take this demon away from me jesus says to him in your weakness is my strength and paul goes along with it he just never questions what's happening and that's why i think it's again i want to just say i think he sincerely thought he met the real jesus but you know you and i both know the real jesus would always leave, cast a demon out of someone and, and not leave them in a torment of a demon and his Jesus says, actually gives him the reason. It's because you're prideful and I'm going to use this demon to keep you uh, uh, non-conceited, okay? Which didn't really work. But anyway, let's, uh, I digress. Now, I want to add here, there's something else that uh, can be added as proof of what Schweitzer is saying. Furthermore, Paul never even once alludes to the panorama of the Savior's life story from even the nativity up to the passion as well as Jesus' elaborate teachings, which fill the pages of the first four books in the New Testament. By contrast, and astonishingly, at Acts 13, verses 24 to 25, Paul does quote John the Baptist from the written Gospels. So it seems to be he has them. He just rejects everything in there. He doesn't want to read it and or, or relay it to us. He's talking to a Jesus in his third heaven, he says in first Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. And he was, he, told, he was told, though, he says there, it was illicit, meaning illegal, for me to tell you what Jesus said up there or, or what he was listening to and list, got, hearing up there in this third heaven. He was told, you cannot repeat anything. But, but he, Paul, was saying these were exceptional revelations, even though he can't repeat any of them. Now, here's something that's ironic, and we're going to do a small digression. And Paul in Acts quotes pagan Greek works far more frequently than Jesus' words in the gospel which only once he clearly did this quote of the communion liturgy. And then we say, see our article, pagan influences on Paul, etc." But we're going to ourselves take a look at pagan influences on Paul. So we'll click the link and we'll go there right now. And one thing you need to understand is the way Paul used this. Uh, wait, wait till you see how he used these quotes of pagans. He literally is equating God Yahweh to Zeus in, in uh, multiple of these quotes. So anyway, let's get, go... Let's take a look at this. Paul puts into the mouth of his Jesus. So this is maybe more of a comment more on his Jesus, why his Jesus is quoting a pagan play. Uh, now, uh, his Jesus in Acts 26, 13 quotes, kicks against the pricks. And this is in a meter of a play. Uh, and actually the meter comes from this, uh, both are plays. So they both use meter, which means a rhyming system. And so the plural S would not normally be necessary unless you're trying to rhyme it to another word. And that's exactly what was going on. So the uh, Jesus of Nazareth supposedly in those Greek plays, either Euripides or Aeschylus, Aeschylus and uh, that's why he's quoting it, apparently. And uh, so it's either either one of these, Euripides Bacchae, but uh, scholars think it's from a Euripides Bacchae, and we'll see a little bit why in a second. And then, uh, or it could be Agamemnon by Aeschylus, Aeschylus 16, at Aeschylus, number 1624, position 1624 in that work. And uh, the reason why the scholars think that obviously Jesus of Nazareth allegedly is using Euripides is because it's, it's almost a story about Jesus, okay, in the sense, in a pagan sense. This is a, a son of God who, well, let's let, read it. The context of Euripides, Bacchae, is that the Dionysius, who's speaking and saying that don't, you can't kick against the pricks talking to the uh, emperor of Thebes, emperor, excuse me, the king of Thebes. And he says, uh, so Euripides is uh, quoting Dionysius in the play who discards his divine nature and walks in the human world disguised. He appears to be just a human being, but he really isn't human. Dionysius, the God disguised in human form tells him the, the, uh, the, there's a king in this one too, tells him that his efforts to resist the new movement will be completely worthless. He is not contending against flesh and blood, but against a God. And so this is what Euripides, uh, in Euripides, uh, 
the God who's now an emptied God, emptied of what made him equal to God. Now he's immortal. Um, well, excuse me, he's, he's still a God, but he's emptied of what makes him powerful of, as a God. So he then tells this king, you are mortal, he is God. If I were you, I would control my rage and sacrifice to him rather than kick against the pricks. And uh, apparently what he's saying is you need to uh, worship Zeus. Okay, so this is a, so the quote is coming out of a context where this God, who's emptied of his godhood, is telling the king here to worship God Zeus. And that's the quote that Jesus would use, which if anyone knew the play, it would be saying, you need to worship God Zeus, who is a pagan god on Mount Olympus, who has all these demigods underneath him. I mean, come on. Is, would the Lord, again, would the Lord Jesus say anything like that? I don't think so. Anyway, and this could be found in the work by A.N. Wilson. I need to take the italics off that. This is his name, Paul, the Mind of the Apostle, W.W. Norton and Company, 1997. I'm going to take that. <laughs> I uh, talk so okay so there's that and now the next quote is uh really horrific that Jesus that Paul would even say these things uh, knowing what his audience will hear in their heads so this is in Acts 17 28 he's going to quote simultaneously these two passages one by Aratus and one by Epimenides and they're both about Zeus so listen to this Aratus is uh in a play called Phenomena says, for we are indeed his offspring, meaning Zeus, the father god of the pantheon of gods. So this is a pagan god for sure. And uh, and then Epimenides from 6th century BC, you know, 600 years before Jesus. Uh, it, Paul quotes this too, for in thee we live and move and have our being. So that is a pagan god named Zeus, and we live and have our being in that pagan god Zeus. Can you believe this is going to come out of Paul's mouth? So Paul is teaching in Acts 17, 28. He's at the pagan pantheon in, in, in uh, Greece. So to show he's erudite and smart, he's going to quote from, in one sentence, he's going to quote the, both passages. So he says, for in him, meaning Zeus, we live and move and have our being, as certain as uh, also of your own poets, he means Epimenides, have said. For we also we are also his, meaning Zeus, offspring, aritas, play, phenomena. So Paul is quoted pagan plays about Zeus more than more than he's ever quoted Jesus if you exclude the communion. Okay, and the communion, I'm, I hate to tell you, it doesn't have a lot of substantive messages there. It's just simply, this is my body, and so on. It's important, but it's not a teaching moment in the sense of, of how to live or any of Jesus's famous teachings. Where the famous teachings coming are coming from pagans, Aratus and Epimenides. Unbelievable. Now, Paul's going to do it again. He's going to call, quote Epimenides from another play, uh, Credica. And I'm just going to s s pause here for a minute. The actual meaning of Paul's, uh, uh, the word that was translated as tent maker for our Bibles, the scholars now agree that actually meant stagehand. Paul was a stagehand at theater. So he would, he would move the sets around, and that would explain why he knows all these plays by heart. He can just literally rattle them off. And that's... Uh, his, so his actual true job, we have misunderstood all these centuries, and uh, we have a whole thing on that if you're interested at the website. Uh, but anyway, let's continue here. So he's going to quote Epimenides where it says, the Cretans always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. This is in Epimenides' Critica, a poem scolding the Cretans for making a tomb to Zeus because Epimenides believes Zeus to be eternal. So, I mean... Why would you quote a passage that is talking about the Cretans did wrong by trying to do a tomb for Zeus when, so therefore the message is that Zeus, the father god of all the other gods, he's eternal. Why is Paul continuing to refer people to belief in Zeus, a pagan god, rather than God Yahweh? But now we're up to our third quote, and he actually uses this as an epistle to a Christian, so you no longer have the excuse you had in Acts 17, he's on the... The, the pantheon, he's talking to all these uh, Stoic and Greek philosophers, and maybe he's trying to pander it. Please all, remember, he says, he, I please all men so that I may save some. You know, that's wrong. Christians should never try to please men. God doesn't need that kind of ple <laughs> pleasing of men, telling them quotes of plays about Zeus. But anyway, so he's saying this, though, to Titus, a follower, a disciple. He's going to quote a passage from a pagan play about Zeus that is defending Zeus as, as an eternal being. 
And he's going to use that in a, a reference to Titus. He, he says, one of themselves, meaning the Cretans, even a prophet of their own said, the Cretans are always liars, evil bees, slow bellies. And by that, by the way, that's an, uh, an ethnic slur against the whole people. I'm sure there were some Cretans who were liars, like all people, like all countries. Why are, why are they being singled out? And Paul is trying to to tell Titus, you know, Crete, when they're going to Crete or listening to Crete, people are all liars. That's a terrible thing to say. And then he's actually, actually going to quote a Latin philosopher, so that raises a, uh, an interesting possibility. His name is Latin, by the way. Pa uh, Paulus is his Latin name, Paulos in Greek, but Paulus, L-U-P-A-U-L-U-S, maybe he knew more than we know of Greek, excuse me, of Latin. So here's he's going to quote from a Latin comedy writer from 190 B.C., Terence, Terentius, excuse me, Publius Terentius, I think that is actually Afer. That is his full name, Terentius Afer, also known as Terence. And this is what Terence says. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them first learn to show piety at home. And this is in a play called Andrea, Act 4, at this link, pages 34 to 44, if you want to look at that. And he's going to quote this in 1 Timothy 5, verse 4. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home. Notice the similarity. I mean, What's the chance he's not quoting? It says children and nephews up there, children and nephews here. He's obviously quoting from this play. He may even be have memorized it. Again, how would he know this play? This play was maybe tr translated into Greek, and then he got it perfectly right. Seems very weird. I, I think what we're really seeing is he did know Latin as well. So again, just uh, to give us a little bit more background here, Paul's name, his real job was a stagehand, and this is uh, now a well-known fact. In fact, the BDAG, and if you're a theological uh, student at a seminary, you're going to know the BDAG dictionary is considered the most uh, uh, important for your guidance in knowing Greek meanings, uh, uh, the meaning of Greek words. And what it says, in the absence of any use of the term skenopios beyond the passive in Pollux and in Hermes, uh, and the lack of specific qualifiers in the text of Acts 18.3, one is left with the strong probability that Luke's public in urban areas where theatrical productions were in abundance would think of skenopios in reference to matters theatrical. So there, and so when you, uh, the word skenopios is used, it's talking about a movable uh, item, just like a tent might be, and that's why they originally, people thought originally meant uh, a movable tent, meaning he was a tent maker, but actually he's the maker of the movable theater elements when you go from uh, during a play you have to move the theater screens and the the furniture all around so that's what was the, the specific meaning of this word and that's why even the bdag says this and so other scholars have pointed out that you know what what explains is rep repetitious use of pagan plays to make statements of theology if to, to christians well he's trying to appeal to pagans and at the same time, he's put uh, uh, basically, uh, and that may even be why he was influenced by his Jesus, allegedly on, on the road to Damascus, quoting the pagan play where Dionysius is a dying uh, God, son of God, of son of Zeus, who and from Mount Olympus, and he's dying, and then he's killed, and then he resurrects, and uh, and then he, uh, you know, basically you know, is back to his old self. He's now back to a God. But to do to get to that point, he had to empty himself of what made him equal to God. So you'll hear in Paul's writings that he Jesus emptied him, came down from heaven, emptied himself of what made him equal to God. He died and re resurrected. It's literally, uh, if you were a Greek and you were hearing this, Paul is talking about Jesus in a pagan play sense of the play by Epimenides, <laughs> that uh of the play Bacchae, which had this god son of god dionysius die like that now let me just say this to you christians if you understood the inside joke it's almost like an inside joke we're being mocked i believe honestly by the jesus of paul because the jesus of paul can't be our jesus telling us that putting himself equal or comparable to dionysius that's why he's using these words. It's a, it's a meter. That's another thing we need to know. The word pricks there is in plural to match a rhyme inside of the original play, which if you just were to say what you do when you are not an animal, you can use what's called a prick to keep them 
from going too fast. And instead, his Jesus uses a rhyming version of it. So it's definitely lifted from the play. That's the scholar's analysis of this. And that's really mocking us by, by making Jesus look like a son of God, Zeus. And, and so it's an inside joke on us. And so we're being fooled. And a, 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 a Greek or Latin person would read this and go, or trained in the, the, uh, the comedies and the plays of that era, you would go, these Christians don't realize it, but their God is really the Dionysius. And they wouldn't take our religion seriously. So it's only when these memories of these plays might have faded out that Christianity could rise because this itself or the Christianity of Paul could rise is only after the memory of these kind of plays would fade because it made our Jesus look like he's a con artist, basically. He's, he's really <laughs> a son of God, Zeus. Why else would he quote directly from a play about Dionysius, a dying son of God who had emptied himself of what made him equal to God and... Uh, He's one of many gods on Mount Olympus. So, yeah, it's just really obvious. So anyway, and then uh, there are other references Paul makes about fools and clowns for the sake of Christ, which is a, a, a known in the theater of those days. It was a very common thing to have the, the comic clown or fool inside of a play to tell the story. And the, and the theater experts go into that and they call it sometimes... Um, they also talk about the guardian mime. Um, uh, I'm a fool for Christ. So that mimics the actions of the arch mime and so on. The mimic fool was a typical character in Greek theater. So Paul is using all these exact terms right out of these pagan plays. And, and, and he is literally writing epistles to us, talking in the terms of the pagan plays themselves. And so that now once you once that became revealed, you can now understand what Paul's doing and why he's very good rhetorically, because he's he's just picking up on rhetorical flourishes of the great writers, the Senecas and the, it's not Seneca, but Epimenides and all these great Greek uh, writing uh, uh, sources he had to pull on for his experience. So so now with that background, you can just see. This is not a good thing that Paul is so erudite in these pagan things and he's injecting it into Christianity. And I would have to say his Jesus cannot possibly be our Jesus because he's, he's giving us more, more quotes from pagan plays than he, Paul, than Paul is ever giving us from a words of Jesus in any teaching. But I digress. So let's get back to the, uh, the contradiction itself. All right, so now we're going to get back to our main article. We've discussed the fact that Paul quotes pagan Greek works far more frequently than Jesus' words from the Gospels, okay? Now, hence, Paul was a well-read man, but never thought Christ's teachings in the flesh, which we find in the Gospels, were of any importance to relate to the Romans, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Thessalonians. He rather quote pagan writers. As a result, Boltman saw things the same way as did Albert Schweitzer. As one commentator on Boatman summarized his influential view of 2 Corinthians 5.16, Paul deliberately ignored Jesus' teachings during his earthly ministry because Paul discovered a new and different preaching than what Christ taught pre-resurrection. This rendered supposedly defunct that prior message of Jesus. So this is in a book called by Paul Barnett, Paul, Missionary of Jesus, William Erdman's, publishing 2008 at 13. Nothing could be more mainstream Christianity, Protestant Christianity, evangelical Christianity than Erdman's publishers. So this is what they're summarizing Boltman is teaching. And this is this is a foundation, by the way, of, of dispensational doctrine, even though uh, dispensationalism came from a, a, a partly from an American writer earlier than Boltman. But basically, Boltman is the fourth most influential theologian of the 20th century. That's his claim to fame, that he wrote so many books and influenced all of our pastors over here that you cannot discard what this is going to say. Boltman regards the historical Jesus as irrelevant. This is a theologian who's teaching our pastors, whose works are in pastors' uh, theological seminaries, okay? And he thinks Jesus' teachings in, are irrelevant, the historical Jesus, meaning the Jesus of the flesh. As to the kerygma, i.e. the preaching, so whatever you preach, the gospel you preach, it's irrelevant, whatever Jesus said to you. As to the kerygma of the risen Lord, whom Paul proclaimed, Boltman understood 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, quote, Even though we once knew Christ katasaka through or by means of the flesh, we know him thus no longer, to mean that Paul chose not to employ his knowledge of Jesus kerygmatically, 
and I hate when these scholars use words that are meant to be so impenetrable, we can't hear them. But what he means is, so Paul would not choose not to employ his knowledge of Jesus for preaching. So any of these uh, uh, messages of Jesus pre, pre uh, ascension are irrelevant because that's not part of Paul's preaching. It's not that he didn't. So the assumption there is Paul knew about him and just deem them irrelevant. I don't need to go into them because they're not relevant to what I need to preach. A view which Boltman agreed with Paul on. Accordingly, the influential scholar of Marburg, Marburg, Boltman's from Marburg, declared Paul the founder of Christian theology. So Paul's claim to fame is that he created what we call theology. So instead of Jesus' teachings of how to live and live righteously and be saved, Paul has now created a theological construct that literally replaces all of Christianity as it was once known when Jesus was here. And it's a whole new theology. And that's why they call him the founder of Christian theology, because when they use the word Christian, they mean Christians who no longer follow Christ theology, those who follow a risen Christ that only Paul knew in his head and was never, he, he said he was never allowed to quote him. It was illicit. When he went up to third heaven, he was told it was illicit. It's impermissible for you to quote anything this Jesus says. Again, is that the way God works with us? No. So we have to we have to believe in a mystery and trust one man to have had all the, the, everything he's saying is somehow exuded, you know, like a channeling of something he can't quote from. It's just, it's just the, that, that we have fallen for this is just so unbelievable. We're, we're just the, the most gullible people ourselves. Paul was extremely gullible that he met with the real Jesus. I'm digressing here. Just I have to comment because it's just so sickening to me to, to have to even relay this to you. But this is this is Boltman. I'm not making this up. This is not Doug telling you that's what it means. This is what these people defended it means. It, Paul is saying, don't even listen to Jesus. And that's that's what he supposedly Paul says. Let's now let's look at Let's look at this and for, let's finish it up. Hence, Paul is viewed to instruct us no longer to teach Jesus the teachings while Jesus was in the flesh, i.e. from his earthly ministry, 2 Corinthians 5.16. So let's go back so we don't forget, I, because we had a lot of diver, uh, digressions. <laughs> Sorry about that. So here it is. Uh, yeah. Paul's statement, 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, Wherefore, henceforth, from this time forward, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. So we do not know Jesus anymore after the flesh. When he spoke in the flesh, that's not the Jesus we follow. And that's why they can actually say Paul gives them complete license to reject and not teach anything Jesus teaches. And, and, and we have to remember that John says anyone who does not remain in the teachings of Christ does not have the Father or the Son. So, I mean, this is a huge, huge repercussion on Christians to follow and believe this and not compare what John says quoting Jesus. Wait, is that quoting Jesus? No, that's actually John writing as an apostle as a guy does. Regardless, that, 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 why doesn't it cross anyone's mind that you have now, according to John, Apostle John, you no longer know Jesus or God when you do this, when you cast the Jesus of Nazareth out the window. But I digress. Anyway, so now we're going to finish up here. The validity of this reading basically of, of how Boltman reads 2 Corinthians, is confirmed by Paul's clear willful ignorance of any of the apostles' writings on Jesus' teachings, boasting what he received of Jesus came through no human but his superior revelations for heaven, see 2 Corinthians 12. But Jesus commanded to the contrary that we teach what Paul refuses to teach in conformance what uh, what in conformance with what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20. Hence, 2 Corinthians 5.16 contradicts Matthew 28.20 20, as Paul and his construe 2 Corinthians 5.16. Far be it for me to claim to know Paul better than the great Rudolf Bultmann, the fourth most influential theologian of the modern era. So, I mean, could you interpret Paul differently in 2 Corinthians 5.16? Well, whatever it is, if I could come up with it, it's been completely rejected and the fourth most influential theologian of the 20th century has already spoken of how, it, how it's interpreted. And his is the teaching that has been given in every seminary of our church of our, in America since the early 20th century. And by the way, Boltman was a, a silent conspirator, if you ask me, with the Nazis, because he never spoke up. And he was a theologian teaching every day while the Nazis are exterminating millions of Jews and are declaiming against uh, uh, Jews. And as we have in another episode on his role during the Nazi takeover, 
He basically is silent when they, the Nazis outlawed the Christian church in the middle of the war. And and we have a show you the picture of their ideal church is the Nazi flag at the front, no crosses, nothing about Jesus. And it's all political uh, uh, theater now. And and the people stopped going to church because it was like, it's no longer church. It's this evil, uh, uh, you know, and what is Boltman does? He's silent as a lamb. And who's the one fighting? The one person who's truly following Christ, and that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who tries to assassinate Hitler, and he ends up being uh, himself uh, uh, killed in a concentration camp just weeks before the liberation of Germany by the U.S. and Western forces. All right, everybody. So that's uh, which contradiction is that? That's number, I think it's 19. 19. Okay, so stay tuned. We'll have more in the next episode. God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.